the Judiciary, Finance, and Civil Law Committee to order. We are holding remote hearings under House Rule 10.01. Uh, we will start with the roll for attendance. Uh, Anna, please proceed. Chair Becker Finn. Present. Representative Muller. Present. Representative Scott. Present. Representative Feist. Present. Representative Frazier. Present. Representative Grossel. Present. Representative Herr. Present. Representative Hollins. Present. Representative Johnson. Present. Representative Liebling. Present. Representative Long. Present. Representative Mortensen. Present. Representative Novotny. Present. Representative Farr. Present. Representative Robbins. Present. Representative Bang. Present. And Representative Zhang. All right, a quorum is present. Uh, first, we'll move the minutes. Um, Representative Hollins, uh, do I have a motion to approve the minutes of February 23rd? So moved, Madam Chair. All right, uh, any discussion to the minutes? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, the motion prevails and the minutes are from February 23rd, 2021 are approved. Uh, today we have, we're gonna start with the budget presentation and then we've got a, a couple of bills. Uh, so first we will go to a presentation from the Department of Human Rights. It's there. They've been uh, before us a couple of times, but this time they're gonna talk about their uh, budget ask for the year. And so we will go to uh, Commissioner Lucero if you uh, wanna introduce yourself and then go ahead. Hi, um, everyone. Good morning. Uh, my name is Rebecca Lucero, and I'm the Commissioner for the Department of Human Rights. It's good to be here with everyone today. I'm hoping that you're able to see the PowerPoint slides that I just shared. Wonderful. Um, okay. Well, uh, I come on, move forward. There we go. Okay. Um, well, we are here today to talk about the budget um, for the Minnesota Department of Human Rights. And just to let you know who's here, there's both myself and Eric Armankanke. Um, I hope you're all familiar with both of us because we've been here multiple times um, and we're available to help answer any questions at any time. Um, as you know, our agency is over 50 years. It's the State Civil Rights Enforcement Agency and our mission at the end of the, of the, in, the, end of the day, excuse me, is to make Minnesota discrimination free. Of course, we have a vision that sees beyond that moment. We really wanna be part of creating a world where everyone can lead lives full of dignity and joy free from that discrimination. Before we get into the budget recommendations, I just want to um, give you a good sense of where our current funding and expenditures look like. There's two things you need to know about this slide. First, our funding comes overwhelmingly from the general fund. Second, we are a people-powered agency. So the vast majority of the budget goes towards compensation. Some additional um, expenses in operating includes rent, IT and some administrative or finance services. IT is by far and away the largest operating expense that we have. Now the Wall Flanagan budget supports maintaining adequate funding with two main adjustments. First, an operating adjustment, and second, a, work, a workforce and equal pay certificate adjustment. And I will talk about each of those in turn. So first, the department's operating adjustment funds the underlying cost of growth to the agency. Um, and the operating adjustment is a 3.7% increase in fiscal year 22 and a 5.6 um, increase in fiscal year 23. Second, I mentioned the workforce and equal pay certificate adjustment. It was actually in 2003 when workforce certificate fee, uh, fees were set at $150. And, and that's been the rate since 2003, $150 for a four-year certificate. So in order to more accurately reflect the cost to administer the certificate, the department is proposing to adjust the fee from $150 to $250. This is for a four-year certificate. Um, the equal pay certificates date back from 2014, also $150, and we propose moving both of those fees to $250 a year. Of course, our budget is fairly straightforward and simple, but I want to make sure I'm always grounding the work, uh, the budget in why we do this work every day. 
So this is um, Kim and her baby. He's actually much older now. Um, Kim was fired um, when she took parental leave. She was on maternity leave um, from a video editing company. And a few weeks into her maternity leave, um, her employer informed her that they had eliminated her position. They had not eliminated her position. And they hired someone else to take that position. And our investigation uncovered that the employer even stated, it's not my problem that she decided to go and get pregnant. So our agency um, worked with Kim um, and the employer, um, found a probable cause, um, and helped recover some lost wages and damages, and required the employer to follow the law moving forward. So this is just one type of case that we work on, an example of the civil rights services that Minnesotans rely on. So thank you. That's it. Um, very straightforward. Let me know what questions that you have. And I will stop sharing. Uh, members, any questions? Uh, and Commissioner, I know we have a couple other uh, staff members here. I'm not sure if they were going to present anything or if they're just available for questions. Thank you, Chair Beckerman. Yes, they are available for questions, um, but not, no other presentation on this. Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you for uh, remaining focused, as, as always. Uh, Representative Robbins. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Lucero. Um, so I just had a couple questions. Your uh, operation increases at 3 point something percent and 5% in the second year is pretty substantial. So could you talk more specifically how many FTEs that is or what that's going to be spent on? Thank you. Uh, Commissioner. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chair Becker, friend, Representative Robbins. So the operating adjustment was calculated um, really by MMB. MMB works closely with agencies to calculate the proposed operating adjustments based on compensation costs, like step increases, um, insurance increases, like health insurance and other cost pressures on state agencies. Um, so if uh, we do not get our operating adjustment, we will have to lay off staff. Um, like I mentioned, staffing is by far where our agency spends its money. So that increase is needed um, to make sure that we can maintain our staff. Thank you, Madam Chair. Robin. Thank you. Um, so thank you, that's really helpful. Um, so I just wondered if you could break that down because we've heard from other presentations, especially that there's a severe, in, you know, significant increase in health insurance for state employees on the horizon. So if you could send something to committee about what goes for salary, what goes for step, what goes for insurance, we could better understand the cost structure. That would be really helpful. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner. Uh, thank you. I'll um, work with um, MMB and we'll follow up with you on that. Okay. And we can have, if you can uh, send that to Ms. Ganani as well, we will send that out to members. So everybody has that information um, when we get deeper into the uh, budget discussions later on. Um, any other member questions? Otherwise, we have uh, we do have uh, two other bills to discuss. Uh, Representative Liebling. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just really quickly, I just wondered, um, Commissioner, is that the same uh, percentage increase across uh, all of the agencies, or are there, if you know, are there some that are uh, looked at differently than others in terms of what that MMB? calculated increases. I, I assume it's, you know, it's probably a compilation of things, including inflation and healthcare inflation and things like that. But is that kind of uniform across agencies? Uh, Commissioner Lucero. Uh, Chair Beckerfin, Representative Liebling, thank you uh, for your question. You know, I'm going to have to defer to MMB or to the other state agencies on what they look like. I believe it is tailored um, by the agency in part based on what percentage, I mean, we are we spend a lot of money on our staff, so that will impact our agency differently than, a, than an agency that maybe doesn't have as much staff and they maybe are doing granting, for instance. Um, but I'm gonna have to defer to others for the details on that. Right, yep, and I can, uh, yep, and I can remind members that the the MMB narrative, uh, you know, if you remember the, the page that's usually in your budget book um, is posted to our committee website already. So uh, members could take a look at that as well. All right. Uh, any other further questions for the commissioner? Otherwise, I'm sure we'll. <laughs> you're sticking around for the next one anyway. Uh, so we will move on to the the first bill on our agenda today, which is House File 863. Uh, Representative Hollins, would you like to move your bill to be recommended to be placed on the general register? 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, that is my motion. All right, uh, we have the bill before us. Representative Hollins, would you like to move your author's amendment? I believe it's the A1. Yes, that is correct. I would. Um, and I can let you know this amendment, um, what it does is it clarifies the data classification provided in the bill. So it um, creates a cross reference to chapter 13, which was recommended by nonpartisan research and clarifies that application documents are public data. Um, it is it rephrases the data sharing authorization language um, as recommended by nonpartisan research, and it is supported by the Department of Human Rights as well as um, other data groups like Mincoji. Great. Um, any discussion to the amendment? All right. All those in favor of the A1 amendment, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, the amendment is adopted. Uh, Representative Hollins, please tell us about your bill as amended. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, and thank you, uh, members of the committee. So this bill, House File 863, um, is a very, it's the Department of Human Rights technical bill. So the changes that are proposed in this bill would make the department's operation more efficient and effective. Um, and the majority of the changes recommended by the office um, a majority of these changes were recommended by the Office of the Legislative Auditor. Um, it's intended to be very non-controversial. It's mostly technical changes and clarifications um, and bringing things into parity um, as, as they are. Um, and since this is a department bill, um, I am going to have Commissioner Lucero provide more details on it. All right, uh, Commissioner Lucero. Well, hello everyone, good to see you again been a while. Um, I uh, want to thank all of you um, for letting me speak today on House File 863, and I want to thank Representative Collins for carrying our department's technical bill. Um, so ultimately, House File 863 is about making the department's operation user-friendly, consistent, efficient, and effective. Uh, they're, they're, the changes we are proposing can be broken down into three buckets. First, recommended changes from the OLA, like uh, Representative Collins mentioned. Second, bringing our statutes into the 21st century by allowing our department to send and receive documents electronically for parties, if parties so choose. Um, and third, make te making technical changes to our equity and inclusion for state contracting sections of the statute. Now, the best way to provide the information and the context for these technical changes is to simply walk through the bill and provide line by line comment. Don't worry, it takes me about five minutes to walk through it all and I think it'll provide all the, the context and information that will be helpful. So I'd love to start um, um, with, let me make sure that I have this open here, um, uh, line 1.11, which is about the familial status. Now, familial, so this is adding familial status to this section right here. Now, I want to be clear, familial status is a protected class status under the statute already. However, in this public policy section of the statute, for some reason, familial status was left out. So MDHR proposes adding familial status for consistency um, to align with the rest of the, stat the statute. Now, if you um, go to the next lines, line 2.10, uh, through 211, as well as 219 through 2.20. These are both about making our services more user-friendly by allowing electronic submissions that either the charging party or the respondent prefer. If you go to line 2.22, now this is an OLA recommendation to change the amount of time a respondent has to respond to a charge to 30 days. Now, importantly, 30 days aligns with the EEOC response deadline as well, so there's consistency there. Um, line 2.31, now that eliminates the word immediate from this section, and this is on the recommendation, again, of the OLA. And this is because if you look below to line 3.3 to 3.8, that section under 3.3 delineates how the department should prioritize cases. So MDHR and with recommendation from the OLA recommends removing the word immediate on 2.31 to remove any confusion on how these two areas of statute interact. We do need to prioritize under 3.3 um, and uh, removing remediate um, clarifies that. Now, if you go to line 3.18, as well as 4.4 to 4.6, those are related. 
I'm actually going to start with line 4.4 to 4.6. Now, this is, a, again, a suggested change from the OLA. The 30 days for respondents to ask for a request for reconsideration or an appeal, that already exists, but it exists only in the rules, uh, not in statute. So OLA recommends this be codified into statute. That makes a lot of sense. It will help with um, uh, clarity and confusion that sometimes comes up. Um, additionally, relating to line 3.18, we want to align the time it takes to ask for reconsideration between both charging parties and respondents. So that's why line 3.18 is also changed to 30 days for the charging party. Now, if you are on page four, following along, line uh, 4.2 and 4.9 are both allowing MDHR to send or receive information electronically if preferred. Line 4.8 changes the word shall to may. Now, this is saying that the commissioner may issue a complaint if conciliation is unsuccessful or unproductive. Now, this is an, another OLA recommendation. Um, to ensure that the department is able to best utilize its resources if conciliation is unsuccessful. Now, both uh, changes on page five, line 5.22 and 5.29, are again allowing MDHR to send or receive information electronically if preferred. Okay, now we're getting to a, a more detailed one. So I'll draw your attention to lines 6.4 to 7.4. Now, this section has to do with workforce certificates. The change MDHR is proposing ensures that both Minnesota-based contractors and non-Minnesota-based contractors that receive state money for a project are held to the same standards. The way the statute is currently written, it's um, holding Minnesota-based contractors and non-Minnesota-based contractors to two different sta standards. So um, we want to align those standards so the same. Importantly, for equal pay certificates, both Minnesota-based and non-Minnesota-based contractors are also held to the same standard if they receive state money for a project. So it's also aligning what um, occurs with the equal pay certificates there. Now, if we look at line 7.7 and 7.8, now this is simply um, clarifying that it is the agency who awards a contract who controls the contract. So it is up to the agency to award, change, or terminate the contract as needed. Now line 7.1 to, uh, excuse me, line 718 to 722, excuse me again. Um, this is um, MDHR recommends um, adding a data classification section to the department's workforce certificate section of the statute. So a little bit of historical context. In 2014, when the, legislator at, when the legislature added equal pay certificates as part of WISA, the Women's Economic Security Act, the legislature appropriately added a data classification, classification section to that equal pay section of the statute. However, the workforce certificate being much older um, is silent on data classification. So this fixes that um, question around workforce certificates and aligns the data classification with the equal pay certificates that were added in 2014. Finally, line 7.22 through 7.24, as well as 7.30 to 7.32, both provide clarity that MDHR is able to disclose any compliance questions on workforce or equal pay certificates to the awarding agency to ensure we can partner both with the contractor and the contracting entity to achieve compliance. Now, this is already public data under ch Chapter 13, and we are adding this to clarify um, for parity with equal pay to support partnerships with contractors and contracting entities. So combining these changes will improve the experiences and services Minnesotans receive from our department and helps us be as user-friendly, efficient, and effective as possible. Before I finish, I want to share that we vetted this bill thoroughly with bar associations, business groups, contractors, and advocacy organizations, and none have expressed concerns with this bill. So thank you for your time uh, today on this, and I'm happy to stand for any questions. All right, uh, thank you for that uh, efficient walkthrough of, of the bill. Uh, <laughs> members, do we have any questions about House File 863? 
I guess that was a, a good a good summary, uh, Commissioner. Uh, Representative Hollins, uh, we don't have any other amendments to the bill. Uh, any closing words? Um, no, thank you for your time. Thank you for uh, Commissioner Lucero to be here and, and testify on this and I hope you'll all support it. Thank you. Yep, I, and thank you commissioner and, and staff um, for doing that legwork to speak with everyone uh, ahead of time uh, to make sure that we we had a bill that is uh, is is good that we we can move forward. Um, with that, uh, Representative Hollins renews her motion that House File 863 as amended be recommended to be placed on the general register. The clerk will take the roll. Chair Becker Friend. Aye. Representative Moeller. Aye. Representative Scott. Aye. Representative Feist. Aye. Representative Frazier. Aye. Representative Hollins. Aye. Representative Herr. Aye. Representative Johnson. Aye. Representative Liebling. Aye. Representative Long. Aye. Representative Mortensen. Aye. Representative Novotny. Representative Farr. Aye. Representative Robbins. Aye. Representative Bang. Aye. Representative Zhang. Aye. Representative Her. And Representative Farr. I have 15 ayes. And you missed next. Representative Grossel. Oh, Representative Grossel. My apologies. Aye. Hi. <laughs> and I, I do see that uh, Representative Her is here. Um, I know I didn't hear her vote. Uh, <laughs> did you get it, Anna? Representative Her. I called her name three times, so. I can see her on the Zoom. Uh, Representative Her, do you want to give a thumbs up or a thumbs down? Representative Hurt. All right. Well, um, <laughs> uh, and Anna, can you give me the the final vote then, with uh, Representative Grossel included? I have um, fifteen eyes. Okay. Great. Uh, the motion prevails. Uh, the bill is on its way to the General Register. Thank you, Representative Hollins. Uh, and with that, I will. Uh, turn over the virtual gavel uh, to Vice Chair Moeller uh, since I have the next bill up. So uh, Vice Chair Moeller, it's all yours. Thank you, Madam Chair. So the next bill that we'll be hearing is House File 696, Chair Beckerfin's bill for child provision or child support provisions modified. Chair Beckerfin, would you like to move your bill? Uh, so moved, Madam Chair. Uh, and then I would also like to move the DE2 amendment that puts the bill in the shape that uh, we want it in. Okay, great. And just to be clear that the motion is that the bill be recommended to be re-referred to the Human Services Finance and Policy Committee. Um, Chair Becker Finn moves her bill and the DE2 amendment. Is there anything you want to say about the DE amendment? Go right ahead. Yep, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so the DE2 does a couple things. So we're basically, we're combining a couple of related bills uh, for efficiency's sake. Uh, so Article 1 will uh, be the provisions that were otherwise in nine, House File 980 as, uh, as introduced. Uh, Article 2 is uh, the provisions that were included in House File 981 regarding the elimination of interest on child support uh, arrears. And uh, Article 3 is the parent education provisions as amended from Representative Scott's House File 348 that we heard a few weeks ago. So it's um, putting some related things in, into one bill for efficiency's sake. And that is the DE2 amendment. All right, thank you. So before we vote on the DE2 amendment, I'll just wait a minute. Are there any questions about that? All right, seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The DE2 amendment is adopted and Chair Becker Finn to your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so House File 980 as amended uh, represents many, many years, is the culmination of many years of work of uh, the Child Support Task Force and 
um, folks who've been following that. Uh, so essentially our child support uh, table has not been updated in a very long time. And uh, there were some other things that we wanted to get changed uh, so that our child support statutes are more, more fair and um, easier on uh, essentially our the previous the way the statute the statute is written now is disproportionately um, putting weight on our low income folks and uh, especially communities of color in meeting the demands of the statute and we were long overdue to get things updated and so uh, with that I will turn it over to my testifiers to walk through the more detailed uh, <laughs> items in the bill. All right, thank you, Chair. Uh, Melissa Rosso, I believe, is the first testifier. So welcome to the committee. If you could state your name and you may begin. Good morning, Madam Chair and members. Uh, my name is Melissa Rosso. I am an assistant Ramsey County attorney and the director of the Human Services Legal Division in the Ramsey County Attorney's Office, which includes child support. Um, as uh, Representative Becker Finn pointed out, this bill uh, represents a long time of work from the Child Support Guidelines Task Force that the Minnesota Legislature established in 2016. The task force included members of, uh, of the legislature, parents, court staff, uh, the County Attorneys Association, uh, state, county, and tribal child support professionals and staff from organizations that work with families. While there wasn't a unanimous decision, uh, all but four members voted in favor of the recommendations that were made to the commissioner of the Department of Human Services. And uh, that was the recommendations were reflected in a report to the legislature in, on October 31st, 2019. Because Ramsey County was heavily involved in that task force and we didn't see any movement on the bill, uh, we decided to approach um, getting the, some of the provisions passed. Uh, so we, we uh, requested a bill be introduced last year uh, and we got to some hearings and then the COVID-19 pandemic hit. So we're back this year uh, asking for much needed changes to the guidelines and I really appreciate you considering this bill. I was asked uh, to present a very brief history of child support in Minnesota, the guidelines and the calculations uh, so I'll do my best to go through that quickly. The 4D Child Support Program was established by federal law back in 1975 in Title IV, Part D of the Social Security Act. Compliance with that act is tied to Minnesota's receipt of TANF funds. An amendment to the act in 1984 required that all states have child support guidelines and Minnesota being ahead of the curve as we always are, uh, had guidelines in place in 1983. Those were called the percentage of the obligor's income child support guidelines, which basically looked at the net income of the payor and applied it to a chart that included the number of children and ranges of income. So for example, a child support payor earning a certain range of income might have been ordered to pay 19% of his or her net income for one child, 25% for two children, 34, three children, and so on. In an effort to make guidelines in Minnesota more transparent and equitable than that, Senator Tom Neville led the charge to enact the current income shares guidelines in 2005. Those were enacted and were effective January 1st, 2007. So how does the income shares model work? Well, very briefly, um, we look at the income of both parents. We calculate something called PICS, which is parental income for child support, which is basically that monthly income plus or minus some things. Um, take the combined picks of those parents uh, and the number of children and apply that to the basic support table, which Amy Anderson will be talking about in a, in a couple of minutes. We determine each parent's share of the combined basic support. Uh, we apply a parenting expense adjustment, which is based on the number of overnights each parent has with the child. Uh, and then there's a different way to calculate support if there is uh, joint physical custody. Uh, child, care and medical, child care and medical support are then determined. And then there is a self-support reserve that is applied to determine the ability to pay. If the income of the obligor falls below the self-support reserve, child care and medical are reduced or eliminated. And if that doesn't help and the income is, is still uh, below the self-support reserve, 
no child care, med child care or medical support will be ordered and a minimum basic support order would be ordered, which is $50 for one or two children, up to $100 for five or more children. I skimmed over this really quickly. Uh, there's actually a lot more to it, uh, but not to worry, there is a child support calculator. So you don't really need to know all of this. You can put the information into the calculator that is on the DHS website. It's basically looking at the parent's gross income, the number of joint and non-joint children, um, putting in the overnights, um, childcare expenses and things like that. Put all that into the calculator and a worksheet uh, is produced that explains the calculation and then the bottom line child support obligation. Um, so that's very, very quick. Uh, and before I turn things over to Amy Anderson, um, I thought I would talk about one of the pieces of the bill, um, which is the Consumer Credit Protection Reporting Proposal. Um, that's found in section 10, starting at line 15.25. Um, last year, the legislature updated Minnesota statute section 518A.685 to accurately reflect that the consumer credit reporting agencies cannot accept reports from states of payments that are being made towards arrears if the arrears had already been reported to the credit bureau. Because updates about payments being made cannot be reported, it's important that county child support offices be allowed flexibility as to whether and when to report those arrears to the credit bureaus in the first place. And we think child support obligors should have the option to enter into a payment agreement and work with the county before that initial report even starts. So, so that's the part of the bill um, that we're asking for is some flexibility and for the option for a payment agreement. Thanks for your attention to this portion and I'll turn it over to Amy for more information on the guidelines table and other things. All right, great. Thank you so much. Um, and Amy Anderson, welcome to the committee. Go ahead and introduce yourself and you can begin. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Um, as indicated, my name is Amy Anderson. I'm an assistant Ramsey County attorney. Um, I have been doing child support for 26 years for Ramsey County. I'm also a CPA um, and I have a small tax practice on the side. Um, that may give you a hint about why I have ended up being the numbers person on these things. I think we got enough information already in about the, the need, the, the fact that we were looking at changing the table. I want to get into some specifics about why the child support guideline table wasn't working. Because um, I've been in child support enforcement so long, I've looked at hundreds of cases. And what I saw is that the percentage of a person's gross income that was going to their child support obligation was too high for low-income people. Um, when we looked at these cases in Ramsey County, we started doing deviations because we thought that the orders were inappropriate. So we couldn't get to a good number without deviating. Most of the time we deviated for taxes. I Maybe mean, we tried to figure out what taxes they would also pay, subtract that number to find what number they had available. The table is also unsatisfactory for people that have many children. So at one point in the table, if you have six children and you make $2,000 a month, the table says that you should pay $1,500 <clears throat> for your child support obligation. That's 75% of your income. Now it probably does cost $1,500 to raise six children, but a person with $2,000 worth of income doesn't have that money to pay. Um, as um, Ms. Rosso talked about there is the self-support reserve and that will kick in and lower that amount. But one of the complexities I found with troubles with the table is that low-income people end up paying every dollar of their income over the self-support reserve to child support. The federal poverty guidelines have changed, gone up by 34% since the table was enacted. That's another reason why the whole table needs to change. One of the things that we've learned when we've been doing child support, and this comes from a study in Orange County in California, is that we get better collections when the child support orders are set appropriately. So the Orange County study indicated that if the support for one child was under 19%, we collected more child support. 
our table goes up to 25% of someone's income for one child. And that's, that is gross income, both <clears throat> for the Orange County study and ours. So we've learned, <coughs> excuse me, we've learned that it's important to set a right size order. And if we do that, we get better collections. So the proposed table, the Child Support Task Force started working on in 2017, um, they hired an economist, Dr. Jane Venor, and she proposed many versions of the table and the people at the task force would say, well, what about this? What about that? And all the versions that we had um, that the task force presented with still had an issue in the low income piece because Dr. Bernard took the economics that said, this is how much people spend on raising children and plugged it into the table. So everywhere in the table provided by Dr. Bernard, it said 25.5% of your income should go to child support in the low incomes. So we knew that that's a problem. The task force knew it was a problem. Dr. Bernard knew it was a problem. I so much knew it had been a problem for years that I had actually written my own table in 2014, because I didn't like the one we had. Um, at that meeting, which I'd been going to all the meetings because I had talked to the task force about the problems with it. And I was so concerned about getting this issue fixed. So at that meeting, I said, well, I can write you a table that will fix that low income issue. So they said, okay, well, uh, we'll give you a shot at that. So uh, that's what I did. I put together, spent some time uh, revising my tables, and I actually revised them several more times to deal with issues as they came up. Um, so I did the low income adjustment. So now on the proposed table that's before you, the highest percentage of income that's ever expected from someone's gross income is 16.5%. Um, and that's for one child. It goes higher as there are more children, but it is significantly lower than the current table for multiple children as well. The, um, after I did the low income issues then the task force to ask me to build it out for four or five and six children because the um, economist table only had up to three children and also asked me to build it out to 30,000. Now the bill before you was a limit down to 20,000 of monthly income for the combined income for the parents as opposed to the 30. Um, so that is one change from the task force recommendation. Um, there is one piece of the table that is actually higher in the proposed table than the current table. It's an income range from 5,200 per month to 9,400 per month. Um, in that range, those numbers are from the economist um, in her table, and she did indicate at our at the task force meetings that the um, cost of living in that range had gone up for raising children, and so she recommended that those increases be in place. The biggest increase in that income range is ninety three dollars, and every place else on the table there is a reduction. Um, at the lower income of the table, I acknowledge that the one I produced is not really covering the cost of um, caring for children because the numbers have, are so low. What that's really acknowledging is that people in that range, if there's just one person working, the other, the other parent is probably on public assistance and is getting some assistance that way. It also acknowledges that some people that may not be on public assistance may be getting help from family and friends. It was, more to deal with the fact that we have a low income on the gore that doesn't have the ability to pay at that range that we reduced it. Now I have not given you um, line numbers for all that I've been talking about um, and I could but basically it's the whole chunk of the middle of the table where the numbers are go well they go on and on for pages. Um, there are some other issues the task force dealt with and these are issues that are important to Ramsey County as well so when we wanted to bring the table change in, we wanted to address these. And these are issues that deal with getting more equity between a party's children, either their 
if they have a joint child that's a party of a child of both the parties, a non-joint child is a child they may have with another party. So there's different parts of the bill that are trying to create more equity there. They're trying to treat um, the children that the parties have together more, more the same as the parties that are separate. And then there's another part of the bill where we're treating the non-joint children that an obligor might have, one that they're paying child support before and another child that may be in their home. We're trying to get equity between those. Um, I do have those line numbers if anybody wants them, but it's a long bill. And if I go through all the line numbers, it's gonna take me a while. Um, that was really important to Ramsey County. Um, and it's, it's a, again, one of the deviations that we would do um, in the current statute. If you have children in your home and you are um, close to what we call the self-support reserve, you don't get credit for those children in your home. And so we have changed that and applied the self-support reserve to the number of your income after the deduction for the children in your home. There's a couple of other items that are in the bill that were not in the task force. First of all, we've added a, a deviation, deviation factor so that the court can choose not to make an obligor support go up if the only change in the case is that the obligee's income is increased. That is a, a factor that can happen in occasional places on the table. And it happens because I drop those numbers so low that the, the percentage of income going to support is increasing. So if the obligee's income increases, overall, they would share that increase. But this gives the court the discretion not to have that occur. Um, we've also included a, another deviation in the statute to make sure that when someone has a parenting expense adjustment, that's reducing their support below the minimum, that they don't get charged the minimum. Um, and the last one is there are some amendments in the bill that deal with the provision of child care information. Um, this is an issue I have seen raised um, in my cases where the parties go along, they don't really, um, they don't, after a few years, they're not really sure what's in their child support order. They just get the money every month and they just pay the money every month. Um, but this one, child care is something that does change over time. And I have, I just had a case in the last four months where, um, the children hadn't been receiving any child care. The, they were 16 and 17. They hadn't been getting any child care for at least three years. Um, and the court made the adjustment to drop the child care expense back those three years. Um, this bill that's being added, and I think um, Diane Anderson may also be speaking towards it. It's gonna put some requirements in there that people provide the information and make sure that people know that it can be changed. Um, okay, now we're at the, the new part of our bill that um, wasn't in last year's that I'm pretty thrilled about. And this is the interest. And this is the whole article too. And again, it's many lines of um, legislation that would be changed. So I'm not gonna go through the lines, but Minnesota law mandates that interest is charged on child support arrears once the obligor is a full month behind on payments. This bill proposes to eliminate all interest charges on child support. Um, the statute that started charging interest was put into law in 1984, but it was not routinely used until 2007 when the latest um, child support system we have, computer system PRISM came on and that could actually calculate it. Um, it was also in place before a lot of other enforcement tools. It was even before we had income withholding. Um, was it put in place and the uh, um, suspension abilities we have for driver's license, occupational license or recreational license. Um, what we have found is that these other tools, um, significantly income withholding, um, are much better tools for enforcement than charging interest. Um, there is a current piece in the bill that allows people to stop interest if they pay their child support plus a payment towards arrears on time for 12 months. And we have utilized that position 
very often Ramsey County seeks out those cases and stops the interest. But what happens is if you're a low income obligor and you have a time period of unemployment or a job change, you might miss a payment or two and you would lose the benefit of being able to do that. Um, or if you had already had it stopped, it could be reinstated just on a job change. So obviously getting rid of the interest altogether would solve that problem. Um, what I've discovered in looking at all these cases is that it, even when we have a person who is now paying their child support and they're paying the 20% to arrears all the time, if the interest is still out there, they will never get their child support paid until the child is emancipated. So it's something that's really a, a, a key thing to stop people staying in debt for their child support obligations. The, we took this very literally and just eliminated the whole piece of interest. Um, Another group of people that is affected are people that are incarcerated. In Ramsey County, when we know someone's incarcerated, we try to bring a motion right away to stop their child support and stop their um, interest. But I don't know if other counties are doing it. If the parent doesn't know to do that, then their child support is increasing in interest while they're incarcerated. Um, there has been some studies about interest and the federal government has been recommending that states take a look at what they're doing with interest. Um, it has been tied to the increase of the growth of arrears that exist on child support. Um, and that's another reason why we are recommending that the interest accrual on child support arrears be eliminated. Thank you all for your atten uh, attention. And I'm available for questions and so is Ms. Rosso. We're happy to answer anything any questions you have about the bill. All right, thank you very much. Um, and we do have some more testifiers. I believe uh, Diane Anderson, you're up next. Welcome back to the committee. If you wanna introduce yourself and begin your testimony. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, my name is Diane Anderson and I'm a former state representative. And I'm here to testify in support of sections five, six and seven of the bill. These sections modify the current statute regarding the child care support obligation. And we received technical assistance from DHS and worked with legal aid and Ramsey County on these sections of the bill. Um, so that you know, there are three parts to the child support amount. There's a basic support, which is how you get the table. Then there's also a child care support amount and a medical support. The statute requires that the child care support must be based on the actual child care expenses and the child care amount of the child support can be decreased effective on the date the child care expenses decreases, which this is not typical of other areas. Um, current law does not adequately, adequately address issues regarding how to change the child care amount when the child care expenses are decreased or they ended. And as you know, child, children age out of child care. The expense for child care may be increased or decreased based on the age of the child or a change in the type of the provider. So in many cases, the obligor is not notified when the child care expense changes or ends. Uh, this bill requires the obligee to notify the obligor when the child care expense ends or the child care amount changes. And the obligee is also required to give the obligor an annual verification with the child care expenses for the previous year. Currently, there are many obligors that are still paying child care portion of their child care support after the child care uh, expense has ended. And there are many people who are still paying for this child care expense for their children when they're even 17 years of age. And there's you know, not been a child care expense for a long time. And family law practitioners have also shared that this is an issue and that the child care expenses are not getting mo modified when there's no longer a child care expense. So one reason why the child support does not get changed is a lot of the time it's cost prohibitive for the people to go to get their child support modified. And so often and often times the person is not even aware when there has been a change of the expense or that the child support amount has ended. So we would really like to have a low cost method for the parties to be able to modify the child support when the child care expense ends. So it's really great. Ramsey County has a procedure 
to help people in their county to get child support modified. They help the parties by drafting and submitting to the courts a stipulation. And we really would like to see this um, procedure used and implemented in other counties. Um, there's nothing mandated in this bill that other counties have to do this, but we'd like to make other counties aware about what Ramsey County does and try and get this help for other people in other counties. So I, I appreciate your support and I'm available for questions. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. And Chair Becker-Fenn, uh, did you have a comment? Yeah, I just I just thought it was important to clarify um, regarding the interest and the changes, especially on the lower end of the table, that this doesn't actually necessarily mean that the parent who's receiving the child support is going to receive any less child support. Um, it actually just makes it so that um, we're not uh, increasing that burden on the the obligor so the the payer of child support you know that people are only able to pay what they're able to pay and so you know we can add all this other stuff on there um through the courts but that doesn't actually increase their their ability to pay and so i think um i just want to make that that clear that this isn't um you know one side could kind of see this as like oh well are you making it so that the the parent receiving the child support is not getting what they're owed and that isn't really what this is about at all it's just making things more fair and more in line with what people are actually able to pay um and then to what uh the the last testifier spoke to i just also wanted to to highlight that that things tend to go into autopilot after a while with a lot of these cases and folks don't even realize that both the person paying and the person receiving and the like nobody is sort of aware of um, how things could be updated to be more fair. You know, it's it's easier to not go into court than it is uh, uh, to to go into court. And so I think um, this is this is really important in making sure that that uh, communication is happening so that folks are at least only obligated to pay what they rightfully uh, should be obligated to pay. So um, and also just want to thank uh, especially uh, Amy Anderson and all the folks who have really um dug into this and and nerded out on this for a long time to try to improve the these tables so um thank you to the testifiers so far all right and we do have some other testifiers but before we get to them i see that representative vang has a question representative vang thank you madam chair i just have a quick question uh, i see that this is a good bill and i see that a lot of work and experience and expertise have been brought into this bill and I really appreciate all the work that uh, you all have done. Uh, I just have a quick question on the um, the charging interest on the arrears. I, I'm wondering if um, that is retroactive. If Miss um, Amy Anderson can answer that. Miss Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Bang. Um, this would not be a retroactive change to the interest. It would stop charging going forward. Um, the interest that has already accrued would still remain out there. Okay. Madam Chair. Yes, any follow-up, Representative Vang? Yeah, if, if it could be retroactive, that would be great. Um, you know, I, I, you know, charging uh, interest on, on arrears, I feel like it's just one of those tools that makes, you know, one of the reasons why being poor is expensive. And, um, you know, if that could be retroactive, I would like to see that added into there. Um, and, and if that's a possibility, thank you for that. Chair becker -Finn. I thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, and as, as we noted, this is on its way to human services next. So we can certainly um, discuss that. I know um, at the time that I was involved with any of these cases that uh, it um, the courts often are able to uh, for, you know, the, the courts can sort of um, stray from the <laughs> from the standards in order to to try to make things right in some of the extreme cases. But um, I certainly would be open to discussing that because it is something it's it's a wrong that could be righted for folks, uh, you know, going back as well. But we, we can we can discuss uh, to see um, whether DHS and, and others uh, what they think of that as well. 
All right, I, I don't see any other hands up at this point. So we'll move on to the other testifiers. Um, we have three other testifiers and I'll just remind you all to please keep your remarks to the bill in front of us today. The first testifier is Scott Vogel. So welcome to the committee, Mr. Vogel, if you would like to introduce yourself and you can begin. Yeah, my name is uh, Scott Vogel. Uh, I started out as a non-custodial parent uh, several years ago. You may remember me, I, Carol Evan ran a few stories on me and kind of was a big uh, custody battle that I ended up getting 50-50, but it was a long, expensive process. Um, I attended many of these child task force meetings you know, over the years. And I think what started as a noble process to reduce child support obligations for the low income families seemed to devolve into the majority of the members, ignoring the concerns of the minority who were really trying to tie you know, for anything other than low income families an economic basis for all these changes. And you know, as many of you know, there were two economists that you guys really looked to um, they were very, very different opinions on, you know, the cost of raising a children. Um, and, you know, as a result, the, the end recommendations ended up, you know, very different than I think what the other economists would have recommended. Um, and to be clear, I think there's a number of positive changes from this bill, but there are also so many hidden consequences from these modifications. Uh, I included an exhibit in here that tried to visually show, you know, the changes, especially in that one child middle income range where the child support's being increased. Um, but I, you can tell that it's just non-equitable across the range. And I really don't think there's an economic basis for that. It just sort of is how the numbers ended up. Um, you know, I have concerns about the non-joint children and you know, how that factors in. Um, you know, so you know, I have also concerns about the pre-tax versus post-tax income being used. And that was something that came up in the child support task force. You know, usually what the reasons I heard of not looking at net numbers, net of tax was, quote, it's too hard to figure out. Or the other quote that astonished me was, you know, well, most separating couples have about the same income. So it's sort of a non-issue. In my case, that's very much not the case. Over 55% of my income goes out the door to taxes. And in my ex's situation, probably a negative tax rate, big differences. You know, I think when you look at the economic basis for the guideline tables based on USDA data, um, it's entirely based on intact families and what they choose to spend on children. And I think using that data to extrapolate how separated families are now legally required to spend on the children is fraught with problems. As an example, you know, why does the cost of children increase when a parent incomes increases? Um, you know, do they spend more on children? Of course they do. You know, the more discretionary income you have, the more you spend on schools, sporting events, all of that. But choosing to spend more, you know, on children is different than what child support is supposed to be, is to meet that base requirement of making sure children aren't in poverty, they're not supported by government funds. So I think, you know, so much of the child support table beyond the low income has turned into a lifestyle support table. And that's really where my concerns are. You know, I think it's noble to you know, make some changes and certainly at the low income level where people can't afford to make some of these uh, high payments, um, but to extend the table beyond and start really in some ways just creating a lifestyle support or a welfare system for middle and upper income families, I think is unfair. Um, you know, so, you know, in my case, you know, I've paid child support that is well beyond what even the USDA would call the cost of raising children. Um, and it's very frustrating, you know, as a non-custodial parent to see, you know, to see some of the numbers in these guideline tables. Um, and, and I have 50-50 parenting now, um, you know, so I support 100% of my household. I support a significant amount of her household. Um, she's had two additional children since. And so there's all sorts of ramifications of, you know, these modifications and what modifications would result from non-joint, you know, children. So I, I just encourage everyone to, I think we really need to look at the economic basis for these adjustments, especially beyond low-income families. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vogel. Our next testifier is Jason Smith. Uh, Jason Smith, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and you can begin. Hi, 
Uh, I'm Jason Smith. I live in North Mankato, Minnesota. I was on the Child Support Task Force. I'm a not a parent, not by choice. Um, I oppose this bill, HF 980. I want to explain my reasons why. Um, you know, what part of this bill creates fairness for low income non custodial parents that does not address the much larger issue? I'll speak on two of those. There is a severe economic and ma mathematical error in the child support model that is used in the Minnesota table. We had heard from two economists. Both of them use the same data. One of them used, along with the Minnesota table, the USDA model for determining the cost of raising a child. And in that, on average, cost of raising a child is $12,000 per year. It's $1,000 per month, per month. And I'll assume some of you have children. And did you receive a raise when you had children? Did the income instantly increase? No, and that's the error. The USDA model assumes that there's an increase in out-of-pocket costs for raising a child. We, as a family, don't get raises when we have children. And so what happens within the family is that there is a redistribution of our family economics. We don't, it's not an increase in costs. It's a redistribution of what we spend our money on. Before we had children, we spend our money on much different things than when we do have children. The problem is, is what the child support table that we currently use, it is an increase in costs. It is a cost that is directly added to the non-custodial parent or the payee of child support. And that's not what really happens in families in the US. The other issue, and this is the most important one, and I, and I, I really want you guys as legislators to understand this, there is no economic data or a model that accurate, accurately reflects the child expenses for two household families. All these models and all this data are from married households with children. And so the issue with the models used is that the median household income in Minnesota is roughly $72,000 per year. That's $6,000 a month. And if we go over to our table at the $6,000 a month amount, we see a number that will be changed to $988. So we'll just call this $1,000. The issue is, is that 30% of this number, roughly $300, is housing expenses. Both parents have housing expenses, regardless of parenting time. Um, our current law allows the presumption is 25% parenting time. That's every other weekend, uh, one night a week. That parent has the housing cost just as the other parent does. It doesn't change. Um, and so the issue is, is that the payee, the parent that is paying child support is paying for the other parent's housing cost along with their own housing costs. The issue that we see here with this table is that each, the parent that's paying has the financial burden of this. And so that's, that's why we see this across the board. And I think what the discord is, is that and I noticed this within the task force is that the majority of members are looking out for single parent households. I get that, and I'm not supporting that at all. What I'm trying to support here is when there's two parent households. When there's two parent households, each household needs to have the amount of money to support their own household. And so I think this table needs to be decreased significantly because of this mathematical and economic error in it. Um, the other issue um, with this, and it hey, seems Mr. like- Smith. I'm just going to yes. stop you for just a second. If you could uh, wrap up, please, because we do have another testifier and we do have member questions uh, and we need to get to a vote. So if you could wrap up your final comment, that would be great. Yes, absolutely. Um, it, it would seem that this table and a lot of these laws are just 
kind of created so Department of Human Services can have a, a better record of collecting child support and not really addressing underlying issues. Um, I ask you guys all to read the report that we put out in 2019 from the task force and especially the minority report at the end of that report. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Our next testifier is Mike Sieber. Uh, Mr. Sieber, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and begin with your testimony. Mr. I'm Sieber. sorry, I was, <laughs> I was muted. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, I am opposed to this bill. I've been testifying for 25 years. Uh, against uh, child support. Uh, I believe it's very bad public policy and I have uh, seen that it's very uh, destructive to children. Uh, taking a step back from what's been presented so far, I haven't heard a single word of how child support is serving the children of Minnesota. How, how is this program serving the children of Minnesota? Uh, I, I submit it serving them very poorly. Um, what we're talking about here is collecting money and uh, that does not equate to uh, uh, children's well-being. Uh, there are a number of problems. I attended all the hearings or all but about two of the, to the child support task force hearings. I testified extensively in front of that committee. I heard other testimony and I uh, agree with Jason and I would encourage the uh, members of this committee to read that minority report. I think it's got a lot of good information in there. We're overlooking the bill, the, it's, it's great. I applaud Ramsey County and DHS for taking suggestions that myself and others have been uh, uh, asking them repeatedly over 25 years uh, to make. And so they're, they're taking a baby step right now, but the, what they're ignoring is, is the following. Um, as Jason Smith mentioned, the underlying data is completely wrong. Um, the tables and formula are wrong. There are uh, driver's license suspensions uh, are counterproductive. Uh, Jason Smith also mentioned double, and uh, uh, there was other testimony, double paying for housing, that's built into the bill. Um, incarcerations, uh, I heard mention of Jane Venor, she's an economist that uh, advises many states across the country and has been involved for many years. And uh, the, the policies that she's promoted have resulted in, in incarcerations of uh, poor fathers, uh, their driver's license suspension and literally blowing up their lives. So I'm not sure that uh, it's a good idea. In fact, it's a bad idea to pay attention to people like that. They're not credible. Uh, lifestyle support is not uh, proper use of child support. There's The whole system is based on a flawed premise that fathers abandon their children and don't want to pay for them. That's been proven false. And uh, also, as mentioned, child support can increase uh, when the other parent gets uh, a raise. It is not good public policy to give judges more discretion to fix a table problem where we couldn't get the table right in this bill. Uh, just give judges more discretion. Judges have far too much discretion. And uh, uh, Finally, I know that time is limited, so I'm, I'm trying to be very quick here in respect of everyone's time. Um, child support is the number one barrier to father involvement in the lives of children. That's not just Mike Sieber saying that. It is uh, in a report, in a, a million dollar study that the Minneapolis Health Department conducted about four years ago. And uh, the, 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 the single biggest thing to come out of that study was that child support is the number one barrier to father relationships with their children. And that is, again, very poor public policy. I would encourage the committee to go to, to, to take care of the fundamental problems with this system and not just um, 
adjust the table, although I applaud uh, this baby step in the right direction. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Sieber. Uh, and before we get to questions, I see Chair Becker Finn that your hand is raised. Chair Becker Finn. Yeah, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And, and I just want to clarify that this, this bill is not tied to whether you're a family with uh, whether it's a mom or a dad or a family with two dads or two moms or um, or anything like that, it's it's not tied to that. Um, uh, this bill isn't intended to fix everything, but I think it is an important step in improving things for a lot of families. And specifically, I wanted to speak just uh, briefly because it was brought up to the uh, issue of driver's license suspensions and civil contempt. And um, I would agree that we need reform there and that those aren't tools that actually make it easier for anybody to pay child support. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm working on those issues, but unfortunately those are actually tied to some uh, federal requirements that I can't change. And so, um, and that we alone can't change here in the Minnesota legislature, but um, you know, would uh, agree that it, it, it doesn't make sense to uh, punish folks um, in that way by suspending driver's licenses. And finally, I just want to thank, I know Representative Scott um, and both, uh, and Senator Kiffmeyer uh, served on the Child Support Task Force and wanted to note that Senator Kiffmeyer is carrying this bill in the Senate as well. Um, and happy to answer questions uh, from members. All right, I see that we have a question from Representative Mortensen. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I didn't really have much of a question, I guess. I just wanted to... Uh, Thank the testifiers for the thoroughness and their thoughtfulness. I think in my what, six weeks in the legislature, I've noticed it seems to be very e easy to craft legislation and come up with reasons on why to do something, especially telling other people what to do, but it's much more difficult and takes a much more analytical mind to uh, break these things down and come up with uh, valid reasons why we should not be supporting them. So I just wanted to thank the testifiers for being here today and giving us very informational and helpful uh, counterpoints to this bill. All right, thank you. Uh, Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And um, what uh, Chair Beckerfin did say is I was on the task force and it, was, um, it wasn't the funnest activity I've ever participated in. We'll just put it that way. <laughs> this is, as you can tell from the presentation um, of the bill today, family law is, it's a kind of a quagmire, to be honest. And there's so many different um, aspects and it seems it, it's whack-a-mole. You know, you want to do something right over here and the minute you do that, another issue pops up over here. Um, this bill is not perfect. The table is not perfect. And uh, in fact, I signed the minority report. Um, but right now, um, this is what we can get. And we, we do, we have to address this, um, the self-support reserve, the low income folks that were paying up to 75% of their income um, in child support. It's just, that's immoral. And I'm not saying the rest of the table is a moral document. I'm not saying that. I think it needs work. Um, but right now, my main concern is that we're not impoverishing parents and children. And um, also, this, this child care piece, that was uh, a bill that I carried. I want to thank Diane Anderson on that. To me, that's just a no-brainer. It needs to be articulated better in, in statutes so that people understand, you know, once their kid is 15 years old, you, you do not pay child support anymore, or you don't pay that part of your child support anymore. It's, it's fallen off. And as Beck, uh, Chair Becker Finn said, people just get on auto, autopilot and they forget that they need to notify the other parent that, hey, kid's not in daycare anymore. Um, so anyway, again, the bill is not perfect, but there are many good things in this bill. And um, I would encourage members to support it. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Scott, for your comments and for all your work on these issues. Um, Chair Liebling. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I just briefly want to kind of actually build on what Representative Scott just said, and, and just to kind of call out something that is kind of behind her remarks, which is, you know, it is much easier to find a problem with something that's being proposed than it is to actually come up with a proposal to solve a problem and work to solve a problem. And there are very few perfect solutions in the legislature. 
and uh, we often are deciding between, you know, which is which is the best of of solutions that are not perfect. So I just really want to call that out. And uh, Representative Scott knows I don't always agree with her on these issues, but they are very difficult issues. And I, I thank her for the work that she puts in and her attempt to honestly grapple with them and find real solutions. And um, this is just a very challenging issue. And um, but I, you know, just wanted to call that out that it's much easier to be a critic of whatever is put before us than it is to say, let's, let's actually pull together and try to find a solution as imperfect as it may be. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Liebling. Representative Johnson. Uh, Chair Muller, uh, thanks Chair Beck Becker Finn for putting, bringing this forward. This is just a small step on some things that need to be done. Uh, it's not perfect. Uh, there's there's always better options. Uh, it's a very difficult situation to deal with. Um, I will be supporting this bill at, at this time, but I wish there's a way that we could ex express how important it is for these kids to keep the nuclear family together. That is the best way to raise our kids with a mom and a dad in them. Um, the parents need to be part of their lives and the parents need to work together to raise those kids. And we've got to find a way to make sure that the parents work together to raise their kids. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Johnson. I don't see any other member uh, hands up. So I'll turn it back to you, Chair Becker Finn for final comments on the bill. Yep, I, thank you, Chair Moeller. And I, I appreciate the discussion today. I think um, as uh, Representative Scott noted, um, this is really complicated stuff. Um, it's uh, it it is when you when you fix one thing, maybe you create a problem somewhere else. And I think the other important thing, as I mentioned before, is the interplay with federal law as well. And um, it was uh, stated very early uh, in the discussion of this bill, but a reference to 4D, and that's a that's a federal funding. Uh, source and so I, you know, there's a lot of acronyms and a lot of things that are very specialized in this area of law, and um, you know, it's it's one of those things where we can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And the overall, this is a good bill. It's uh, no bill is going to fix everything, but I think this does um, improve things in an area that that really does need improvement. Um, and, and finally, I will say, yes, of course, um, our kids do better when we have more people um, loving them and supporting them, um, whether that's, um, you know, a, a family with, with grandparents in the home or, uh, you know, two moms or two dads, you know, whatever it is, I think the more people we have um, supporting our kids in, in every way is, is incredibly important. And, and ultimately, that, I mean, that is the point of, of working on these issues is to make things better. Uh, for our kids. And so um, I appreciate the, the testimony and the discussion today and would ask for members' support. Um, and with that, Madam Chair, I will renew my motion that House File 980 uh, as amended be recommended to be re-referred to the Committee on Human Services, Finance, and Policy. Okay, having renewed that motion and seeing no other member questions, the clerk will take the roll. Chair Reckerfin. Aye. Representative Muller. Aye. Representative Scott. Aye. Representative Feist. Aye. Representative Frazier. Aye. Representative Grossel. Aye. Representative Herr. Aye. Representative Hollins. Aye. Representative Johnson. Aye. Representative Liebling. Aye. Representative Long. Aye. Representative Mortensen. No. Representative Novotny. Aye. Representative Farr. Aye. Representative Robbins. Aye. Representative Vang. Aye. And Representative Shang. Aye. There are 16 ayes and one nay. All right, there being 16 ayes and one nay, the motion prevails and House File 980 as amended is recommended to be re-referred to the Human Services Finance and Policy Committee. And I will turn the gavel back over to Chair Becker-Finn to close us out. 
All right. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair Moeller, for uh, doing an excellent job uh, in chairing that discussion today. Um, do just want to note for members, um, we will be adding, um, as in case you haven't noticed, we've got uh, a couple of extra hearing times that needed to be added. I thought it was important that um, we have time to discuss our bills um, and uh, you know, really make sure that our committee is is the one who's looking at those those data pieces. And so a lot of the bills that we will be hearing during these extra times that are added are related to our responsibility uh, as the civil law committee in in uh, reviewing all of those data pieces that are in all kinds of different bills. So um, I know we will be very busy in the next two weeks. I appreciate uh, members time and attention to all these uh, important bills and um, we will we will see you tomorrow, <laughs> um, as uh, we've we've got a couple bills to move to move tomorrow. So we will do our best, um, and I know my staff. Uh, we're we're all doing our best to make sure we post things as early as we can, so that folks do have time to review and make sure they understand um, what's what's being and done in all these different bills. So we will continue to try to do that as best we can, so everybody can uh, have adequate time to review everything during this very busy time of session. Um, and with that, uh, now you get an extra 10 minutes to go get some coffee. Uh, thank you, everybody. And we will see you tomorrow. And we are adjourned. <laughs>